Okay, up next we have John Autopsy. I'm gonna bring him in right now. Thank you so much for being here. We're super excited to have you. Hey man, thanks for having me. I wanted to start off by saying thank you so much because all of the music you have heard throughout the whole day, that little intro was all provided graciously by John and it's super awesome. So thank you so much for letting us use those tracks today. Glad you guys asked, man. It's, it's neat to, to finally, you know, start doing stuff again. It's been a while since I've been able to crank anything out, so. It's great. It's fun. It's, I was, you sent us a long list of tracks and going through them all. I was like, these are so, these are amazing. They're so much fun. It was, I, I can say our whole team enjoyed just clicking through and playing a bunch of different music. Um, nice. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, do you want to start off by talking a little bit about your background before getting into the haunt industry and the audio industry and really how that all came to be? Yeah, I, I pretty much uh, started in the haunted attraction industry back in 2000. Uh, it was, uh, you know, I had gone to Not Scary Farm as a guest for the, the longest time. And was I remember going and seeing, you know, when I'm when I'm 18 years old, when I'm able to work, and I totally want to do that. So, you know, when it came around, I was like, sweet, you know, I'll do this. And, you know, maybe if it's fun, I'll, I'll come back. I'll do it again next year. You know, not knowing that Not Scary Farm is just this big, intricate family. You know, you get all these people that just do this year round. That you, you know, that's that's their lives. It's Not Scary Farm. So, mm -hmm. you know, once I got involved in that, it was just. I mean, that's that's what my life turned into was just you know haunted attractions and Halloween and stuff. You know, I'd I'd always been a fan of Halloween, so to to be that involved into it, you know, it was it was a neat experience to actually be a monster and be able to scare. And then that in turn got me into starting to, because I've always been influenced by music. I've always been a big music fan. And to start making my own music for Hans, that was kind of a big thing for me. So at what point in your timeline of your of your life did you decide, because you were a monster at knots, correct me if I'm correct, monster at knots, at what point did you decide, I think I wanted to go into sound music, this is what I want to do. And what steps did you take to sort of get into that exact career path? Like how did that all come to be? Well, when when I was making music, I mean, I was making music back in high school, and I, I had very different m musical influences. I had a lot of bands. I was into, um, like, especially in the you know in the late '90s and early 2000s. I was big into new metal. Loved loved that type of music, but I was into a lot of underground bands. Bands that didn't get played on the radio. Bands that you know probably would never get played on the radio because they didn't have that kind of audience. So when I was very much starting to get involved in music and starting to make music, and I, I kind of realized it would be harder to start a band, like harder to get a group of guys with me and they all have that kind of same musical influence that I've kind of had. And I figured, you know, let's, let's try sound design. Let's try something that's, that's more just intricate and a little bit more intimate and being a part of the haunted attraction industry. And, you know, just having that drive of already wanting to make music. I was like, this is perfect. I can make, you know, I can make scary music. I can make creepy music that, you know, you could play anywhere. And even though it's not going to be played on the radio anytime, you know, it's still something that I enjoy doing. I've always loved Halloween. So being able to, make that kind of music you know once i started to actually do that and started to focus more on doing sound design and doing music production just for halloween i kind of felt like i could i could do something with this you know i could make i could make something more than just you know you know me in my bedroom making music yeah that's awesome um so for you what is your general timeline look like for creating an audio track or design for an experience um usually when i'm when i've got something it's usually i start working about things about july that's when I'd say that my season usually starts normally when things would, you know, be opening up in October. We, yeah. you know, we have right now, but usually about July, August, that's, that's when things start picking up for me. And I start getting, um, if it's a, if it's a major haunt, I mean, July is, is pretty much the latest that I'd want to get involved with that because it's, you know, there's so many different things. I remember when I got involved with Winchester mystery house and they just had, I, it was just a stack of different <laughs> here. And they got that to me in July. And so at the time that I was working, doing the sound for Winchester Mystery House, I was also starting to, you know, gear up to be a monster for Not Scary Farm that year. This was uh, 2011. You know, I also was doing, I mean, I'd say a dozen other haunted attractions. So usually with the big ones, it's, it's July. You know, give me, give me something to work at. And from July, August, I mean, pretty much all the way up to opening night. You know, I'm working on these things. And then once the opening night goes, They'll give me a call up and say, hey, you know, can we change this? Can you give this audio, you know, a little bit of a, of a change? Sometimes it'll be volume. Sometimes, hey, we'd like to add this in. I mean, that's after the first weekend, you know, I'm not I'm not done. You know, opening weekend is like kind of like a test phase in a way. So it's it goes from July all the way to sometimes mid-October working on these things. So, so when you're generally brought in on a project, at what phase of the design is it generally in? Like how much are you given to work with at the time that you're brought in and 
how do you use that to inspire you or to make the tracks that you use? It, it really depends on who I'm working with. Some some places that I've worked with are very, you know, like once again, we'll go back to Winchester Mystery House. I mean, they had a, a list and I had a meeting with them, a business meeting with them, and we went over everything. We went down the list of all the different sounds and they asked me my opinions and what I thought and things like that. So some places are very, you know, very focused. They know exactly what they want. And other attractions, they'll, they'll walk me through their event or they'll give me kind of a lowdown of what they're looking for, but they're like, you know, we trust that, you know, do your thing and you know if we like what we hear perfect if we don't we'll let you know and we'll, we can change some things around it, it really depends from attraction to attraction the size of, of who I'm working with what I'm working with it's there's I mean everyone's gonna be a different experience so for you personally on a creative side when you're brought on a project what's the first thing what's your first step what's the first thing that you do generally once you're brought on to a project if, it, if it's possible, I, I try to actually go to the venue. I try, try to go to wherever they're building the attraction, wherever they're setting everything up, and try to walk it. You know, if I have the opportunity, that's one downside that I was never able to go to Winchester Mystery House, and and I've been there in the past, but I wasn't actually able to go down there with a team and walk the event and walk down. You know, where they were setting everything up, it was more kind of like like it was a stack of papers. Like here's what we want to hear, go for it. If I have the chance to actually go down to these venues, to actually walk the entire thing, especially to be able to walk with the creative director and kind of get into his mindset. And I'm always talking to creative directors and I say, hey, you know, if you, if, go ahead and talk to me like a haunter, go ahead and talk to me like, you know, this is what this is supposed to happen in this room. Don't talk to me like I'm just some normal person that isn't gonna know what the hell you're talking about. You know, if you talk to me like this monster's gonna be over here and this sound's gonna be over and this is, you know, I totally understand. I totally get there because I've been, you know, a monster for so long that it's like, yeah, okay, I totally get what you're saying. So if I have the opportunity to actually walk the event and actually get, you know, hands on, so to speak, with wherever I'm working with and the person who's in charge, the person who is imagination has put this whole thing together, that would usually be my first step, you know, beyond any else is give me the opportunity to check out what I'm actually going to be designing for. Yeah. So, and then from once you've had that initial creative spell, now moving on to like the actual creation process of the actual music, what technologies do you generally use? Do you generally write? How, how is that process in your head and putting it onto technology? How, what does that usually look like? With um, the technology I usually uh, use is uh, Acid Pro. That's the the sound uh, sound creation I've uh, always used from. I mean, pretty much before I was ever doing any kind of following stuff. When I first started making music, I got a demo of Acid Pro with some, uh, I mean, it was just probably like, maybe had like 30 different sounds in it. And I took those and I just went nuts with it. So using Acid Pro, being very familiar with that for, I mean, over 20 years now, plus, I mean, pretty much any instruments I can get my hands on. I've had, you know, dozens of instruments throughout, you know, all the times I've been doing this, random guitars and bass guitars, I've got a, a mini chord synthesizer. I mean, pretty much, you know, anything that I can use to, to make any kind of sound, you know, I mean, I'll be at, you know, garage sales and they'll be tossing away some like $5, you know, guitar. And it's like, don't throw that away. I'll take, that. I'll give you 10 bucks for that. You know, so anything that I can, I can possibly use, because with, with Halloween, with haunted attraction, sound design and things like that, you can really go nuts. You can use all kinds of stuff. So the more that you have, the more, I mean, the wider your imagination is when it comes to sound, the more you're going to get a lot of usage out of pretty much anything that you can find, not just around the house, but anywhere. So, so on a musical composition basis, you talked about having the synthesizer, having the guitar, having a, a wide plethora of instruments. Do you generally start like rhythmically? Do you usually start like, oh, I really like this groove, I really like this rhythm, or is it, do you start atmospherically? Like, what, what would you say you generally start with in terms of a compositional standpoint? It, it, it very much depends on what I'm working with. If it's if it's like say I'm creating a, a back background for an outdoor area, so someone's got like a forest or something, you know, I'll put that together and I'll start basically with the very basic skeleton of a sound of a forest. So, what would the basic things you'd hear in a forest? You'd hear you know wind, or, you know, referring to Halloween. You hear wind, you'd hear birds, but you wouldn't hear like you know like that really nice bird song. You kind of hear like crows and stuff like that. You know, you hear creaking trees, and and then from there you'd start adding in, or at least personally, I would start adding in things like, you know, what would you hear but not normally see, especially if it's for a scene where, like, uh, I, I recently wrote um, a track that was based on the movie The Ritual, uh, which is on Netflix. If you haven't seen that, excellent horror film. I would recommend. <laughs> um, 
And the way that it's kind of kind of put together is it's this large creature that's moving in the forest that you don't really see, but the thing's huge. It's kind of out there, almost like a Jurassic Park kind of thing. And I kind of envision, you know, what is this thing going to sound like, you know, snapping branches as it walks around? And what kind of uh, bass is it going to make as its, as its feet are stomping across the ground? So you really have to get a lot more imaginative than just the things that you might think that you would see in a forest. When I used to do classes for Scare Lane and Midsummer Scream, I used to focus those classes on, you know, think about the things that you wouldn't normally see, but you would hear in a scene like that. You know, and you can really go nuts with that. You can, I mean, you can make up anything because you're kind of creating the whole scene in, in your head based on what they're giving you, especially if, if, the, if the creative director trusts you enough to, you know, hey, here's what we, we're looking for. Go nuts, go insane. I mean, you know, I can go and, and think of all, I, I've gone back to creative directors and say, hey, would you mind putting like a, a radio prop somewhere in this room? Because I've kind of got an idea of having like a radio playing in the background. You know, things like that have totally, you know, changed kind of, you know, scenes sometimes with the way they've designed things. That's great. And you kind of talked about how scenes can influence the sound and how the sound can influence the scene. How often would you say that your inspiration comes from outside sources versus you're directly just being inspired from the, the, the haunt itself? And what are some of those inspirations that you generally get? Well, one of the main things that inspired me to start writing specifically you know sound design and music production for haunted attractions was being a monster with not scary farm there was a year when i was this was back when i was still in a maze so this was 2002 and i was uh, hannibal from hannibal hannibal lecter and it was the scene from silence of the lambs where uh they've already caught him and he's kind of locked up in that in that really big open room and so the scene that i was in as hannibal lecter it's the aftermath he's already taken out the cops he's already got one of the cops strung up and the very first night that I was in there, the only sound that was in there was just a police siren. That was it. And I'm like, and I'm like, wow, I'm going to have to hear this for an entire month and a half. This is going to be awesome. So from there, I kind of, I kind of based a lot of the things that I, I teach, you know, especially the classes that I've done with sound is, is think of the things specifically from that movie. Think of the things that might not have been in that room, but you would be here. I mean, so, so, you know, one of the things from that scene, the movie, you know, if you're familiar with that, you hear gunshots, but the gunshots don't come from in the room that they're in. They're from outside. They're from, you know, down on another floor. You might hear police sirens, obviously. You know, you're going to hear the police screams. You're going to hear all kinds of stuff. Uh, I believe, you know, there's a radio playing, at, you know, in, in his cell. There's all sorts of different things. So with that, it's not just what you see, but I mean, also think of the location where it's at. He's also in a building, which is downtown city somewhere. You might hear traffic outside. You might hear, you know, cars going by you might hear horns honking you might hear street vendors things like this so you can really you know if you have if you have a a scene that you can really build upon you can kind of go nuts with all the things that you wouldn't actually see in that scene so you kind of talked about a lot of effect noises the sirens the gunshots the people talking what do you think is an effective balance of diegetic versus non-diegetic sounds and if you can explain that a little bit to people who might not know what I'm referring to when I say that. Well, I think, I mean, with walking through a haunted attraction, you're going to have that scene already painted out for you. You know, you're already going to see things that they want you to see, that you're going to have that scene that's going to build that. So you really don't really have to include every single thing. I mean, one thing going back to the whole um, Hannibal Lecter thing is sirens obviously were part of that scene, but you got to think about it, the sirens were outside. You know, so it's not just, you know, everything that's going to be playing in, in the scene that you're going to be hearing. You know, you're not just going to be hearing, you know, Hannibal Lecter talking. You're going to be hearing all sorts of things. And, and you can add sorts like like footsteps and things like that, things that could be going on in the room that that might not actually be, you know, what the creative director initially intended. But adding, you know, the non diegetic things, adding those little things in there. You know, especially if, if someone's, you know, dedicated to haunted attraction sound design or just sound design in general, they're going to come in, they're going to hear those things. Because I guarantee you one thing that they're definitely going to hear is if there's no sound or if there's a, a, a total limit of sound. You know, if someone's saying, man, I could have painted this whole scene together instead of just throwing a, a siren, you know, that's because that's that's where you totally go from the, the, <clears throat> excuse me, the non-diegetic to the diegetic is is completely, you know, using your imagination, using what else could possibly be in that scene. And, and Hannibal Lecter is only, 
you know, that scene is only specifically based on that scene. If you have a scene that has never been seen before, a creative director created something from his imagination, you can get into his head about that and think about where his mindset was. Think about what he was thinking of and what he might think, even though he didn't have it in the scene, what might be in the background? What might you be hearing, you know, say things are trying to get into the house. Say you're, you're, you're making a cabin scene and there's things outside trying to get into the house, even though when you're walking through, you don't actually see those things. You know, it, it adds more depth into the scene. And it kind of is what made me get into sound originally. Because I remember going through, once again, at Not Scary Farm, going through a maze that had, um, you're supposed to be going through the sewers, but you hear like the dripping noises and stuff. And I'm like, you know, the scene's not very, it wasn't painted very well because it's just kind of very dark. But I'm like, it made me feel like I was in a sewer. It made me feel like I was going through somewhere, you know, dark and grimy and gross, even though you couldn't necessarily see that. So, so generally speaking, when you're looking at, let's just say you're working on a maze, do you try to have like an intrinsic theme or mood that you're trying to create throughout the entire experience? Or do you generally look at it scene by scene? Or does it depend? I'm sure it depends, but can you talk a little bit about how your creative process works in that sense? It's totally scene by scene. It's, if, if I have someone who, I've had people who has specifically said, we'd like the sound to progress throughout the entire thing. So we'd want one, you know, one base kind of tone or one base kind of groove that runs through the entire attraction. But that has been, I mean, nowhere near the majority. It's very minimal people have done that. So when people like Winchester Mystery House or Sinister Point or these places who have these big kind of venues where not every scene is going to be different or they're going to have different things, different themes throughout the entire maze, you know, I can go nuts. You know, I really don't keep the same theme from one room to the next. And it also kind of gives every single room its own specific feeling, its own specific mood. You know, it's not just, you know, one song playing throughout the whole thing or one kind of same basic kind of tone throughout the whole thing. It's every room's got its own life. Every room's got its own presence so that when you go in and you leave the maze at the end of the thing, you're going, hey, man, this room was really cool because I heard this and saw this and this was going on. And that's how I kind of have always based my sounds, especially with, with any kind of maze. If you're going to have a different room, even if it's the same theme throughout the entire thing, I kind of feel that having a different sound for every room, a different tone, especially because, you know, every room, one great instance is Reign of Terror in Thousand Oaks. I mean, they are massive and every room is different. And I mean, that's a perfect example where one straight tone wouldn't work throughout the entire thing, especially because the farther you get into that maze, the more the themes just wildly change. You'd be walking through someone's house and then all of a sudden you'd be in a morgue, you know, things like that. Yeah. So it's can vary differently. I know you spoke a little bit about this already, but you were talking about how when you were Hannibal Lecter in that scene and how that inspired you, but are there any other examples of times that, or even today that you think being a monster directly influences your audio design and what you do on a day-to-day -day basis from the design standpoint? One thing I've tried to do with, with any kind of sound design when it comes to especially if it's in a maze, you know, with, with outdoor things and street zones and things like that, I, I kind of have a little bit more liberty and I kind of go nuts with a lot of things because being a street monster, being a, a monster that's able to walk around and isn't confined to one room or one little corner of a room or things like that, you know, they're able to, <clears throat> excuse me, they're able to walk around and kind of entertain themselves on the slow nights. You know, they can go, one area's not working, I'll go down here and I'll work an area. When it comes to mazes, I do my absolute best where if I'm making a, a maze soundtrack for a specific room or for any room, I try to make it so that the person who's in that room isn't going to be ripping their faces off because they have to hear this thing all night. You know, I will go back to the whole police siren thing. I mean, I remember the first night when I heard that and I was like, oh, wow, this is going to suck having to listen to this. So that was a total inspiration of, you know, when I write things, I want to write it so that if. I was stuck in that room. I'm not going to be like, this sucks. I'm going to be like, I can work with this. And that's why sometimes you'll have, I'll write a soundtrack for a, a maze for a room that a, a normal guest would walk in and out in three seconds. But the soundtrack itself is about five minutes long. And, and, and I totally get behind, you know, telling the same story to every person, everybody getting the same experience. And, it, and that's what it is. Even though it's a five minute long track, you could still walk through there and hear a different part of that soundtrack, but still get the same you know, that same feeling, that same theme, that kind of feeling of dread and that whole tone that I'm trying to put across, no matter what point in that five minutes you walk through that room, you were still feeling it the same time somebody else did three minutes earlier. You know, it's just, it's something to not only give 
a much wider experience and to be able to be more creative and be more just very extravagant with these with these soundtracks but it also gives the person in that room who has to listen to it every single night the chance to be like okay this isn't terrible because at least it's not you know a one minute long looping track of ice cream truck or something yeah which i and i totally apologize to my <laughs> Do you ever do you, kind of a fun question? But do you ever include Easter eggs in any of your attractions? And do you have any examples of those? And how does yeah. that happen? <laughs> I've uh, when I first had the chance to write for Sinister Point, which is the uh, first one of the first major attractions that I wrote for in 2009. I found a program that would transfer um, typed out words into Morse code. Wow. So one of the tracks that I wrote for that, I wrote out Autopsy, and then had that playing in Morse code. And so the, one of the tracks that starts up starts out with Morse code, autopsy, over and over, over until the track starts up. So I've, I've added a lot of Morse code. There's a specific sound. Um, I'm, there's no way I, I could describe it, but there's a sound that I use frequently that I, is kind of like my my trademark sound that that appears in maybe like one out of every five tracks. But I'm sure if you've listened to a lot, definitely. Heard I'll probably one. notice it. <laughs> yeah, That's awesome. That's great. And do you have a favorite project you've worked on, like a story that and why that's your favorite? and Kind of the background on that um winchester mystery house was was probably the and, and i was so bummed that i never got the chance because I, I wrote for winchester mystery house in 2011 and 2012 and you know i was i was totally just you know i was jazzed that i got to work for that because i had been there before as a guest like you know about five years prior so actually getting the experience to do that was just i mean it was awesome and the whole team that i worked with was great the Winchester Mystery House people themselves were very friendly. You know, they were, you know, awesome to just talk to in general. They were to go into that meeting and have this. Here's the stack. Here's everything we want you to hear. What do you think? And let's write. Let's go over notes and stuff. I mean, it was just it was such a well organized and just such a well oiled machine to work with that. It was one of those things where I'm like, I was so bummed that I never got the chance to go and check it out because I was still working Not Scary Farm at the time. You know, I was I was Not Scary Farm was starting. You know third week of September and would run all the way through October. So I didn't have the chance to drive out to San Jose to knock this thing out as much as I wanted to. And of course, in, in 2013, the year that I totally planned to go out there was the year that they stopped doing it. And I was like, Ugh. Oh, <laughs> that's such a bummer. Now, are you generally, you kind of spoke how you were at Not Scary Farm for that through the entire run. How often in a run of a project that you are walking through on a day-to-day -day basis, do you make changes? Are you actively changing whether it's tracks, whether it's mixing, whether how much power, like not power, that's not the word I'm looking for, but how often are you making those sort of changes throughout the entire run of the event? Usually with, with things like that, I kind of depend on what the creative director believes. If, if they hear something that they want to change, especially because, you know, nine times out of 10, I'm not actually at the event. I can't actually be like, wow, that sounds terrible. Let's go for change. But I mean, there was, there was one, the one year in 2012 when I was working for Sinister Point as one of their monsters, and I had written this, this kind of swamp track and I had put an owl in there, like the sound of an owl hooting. And it comes up at like two points in the soundtrack. But I remember being a monster there and and hearing the owl go off. And it was so much louder than the rest of the soundtrack. It sounded like there was a hundred foot owl somewhere behind me. <laughs> Let me fix that for you. But most of the time, I totally rely on the creative director. If the creative director says, hey, let's go and change that shirt. But if, if they're like... You know, I, it's, it's totally, you know, their call on that. I, once I give them, you know, the track, it's like, you know, that's, that's what it is. So we have some questions here. Um, what advice would you have for home hunters who want good, who want good to create their unique soundtracks? Well, I mean, with home hunters, that's, I mean, that's a solid thing where you can just go nuts with anything you want. You don't, you don't want to get too muddled with stuff in it. Also depends on how big your, your sound system is, but with, with home haunters, you know, even with even with the basics, the basic home haunts that I've done in the last few years, I've written soundtracks for them, and I kind of, I go, I use a lot more liberties with home haunts and yard haunts because you, you have the chance to really scare a different group of people than you would at a haunted attraction. You know, with home haunts and yard haunts, you're getting you're getting the kids, you get trick or treaters coming up, and you know, I don't want to go out and flatten these kids. You know, I mean, like me working at not scare farm, I'm not going to go out and scare a little kid because I want these kids to come back. You know, be like, hey, that was a blast. And I'm thinking, like, going, wow, that sucked, and I never want to go back. <laughs> yeah. You know, with haunts and yard haunts, I, I really kind of just, you know, go deep into the sound and really just go nuts. And, and sometimes I've, I remember uh, a house that I used to live in in Whittier, and it was this 
really big fancy house and we wrote this i wrote the soundtrack out and then we did the whole yard haunt during the night and i remember this kid coming up with her parents and she stopped at the, at the at the front of the walkway and she said i don't want to go up there the house is making noise and i'm like boom that's perfect that's exactly what i'm going for you know so to hear a little kid say that i'm like that's awesome because with home haunts and yard haunt soundtracks you can you can get a lot more weird it, it you get that imagination from a child that you wouldn't normally get from, you know, the, the normal everyday guest that goes into knots who might've had a couple, you know, a couple of drinks and it's just in there to have a blast. You have these kids who might be their first time going up to a, you know, any sort of house, even if they're not walking through it, even if it's not an actual attraction, this is their first experience with any sort of, of haunted house, any sort of kind of scare or haunted attraction. So I really kind of just go nuts with haunted, you know, with home haunts and yard haunt soundtracks. And, and I know that, you know, I know that things are really tough right now and we're kind of going to be stuck with home haunts and yard haunts this year. So I'm, I'm totally open to help out any yard haunts and home haunts that, that definitely need any assistance this year. I mean, I know that, you know, times are tough. People are going to have all kinds of issues with money right now. You know, I'm totally down to help you guys out with yard haunts and, and home haunts, any kind of soundtracks you guys need this year. Hit me up. That's awesome. And then we have another question here. Um, He's curious what the max BPM you're willing to hit for a track. I don't want to go too much because, I mean, you get to a point where, it, you know, again, it, it also depends on what kind of what kind of track I'm. If I'm writing like a clown track, you're going to have a lot more beats per minute than I'm, you're going to have a track like some kind of outdoor forest scene. You know, if I'm using an actual music production or if I'm actually making a sort of music track, any kind of thing where you're going to listen to that's going to have a beat to it, I try not to get too insanely intense unless that's exactly what the creative director if the creative director says hey we want something that's just going to be nuts then yeah i'll crank up the beats per minute you know you know as, as high as it until it gets to the point where it's like okay this is unlistenable yeah. but it really depends on you know what i'm writing for what the scene is if it's outdoors indoors what the creative director wants because i've had creative directors say hey let's tone this down you're getting a little bit too insane with these things so it, it's really depending on you know what I'm writing for and what, you know, who I'm writing for, what they want. We have a question. Have you ever created a sound by accident where it wasn't the original intention, but it ended up working out? Uh, when I was writing my uh, first album, and it's for Nightmare, there was a track and it, well, layering is always a, a perfect thing to do. I mean, that's especially with, with Haunted Attraction sound design. You always kind of want to layer things. You always want to put sounds on top of sounds, sounds behind sounds. and I mean, that's a, that's a great way of discovering things, you know, I mean, to, like happy little accidents. Let's do the Bob Ross turn, you know, hearing things where it's like this sound stacked up on top of this sound totally sounds like something I wasn't expecting it to. I mean, that happens pretty much almost every time I'm writing something big, especially if it's something that has a lot of detail in it. you know, indoor scenes that want actual like ambiance. They don't want a beat or anything, but they want the sound of like a log cabin, the, in, the internal of a log cabin totally painted out stacking things on top of that i mean that's how you come up with new things to learn you know to use in your future future things i i've i've so many times stacked things on top of other of other track of other sounds just to come up with something that i was completely unexpected do you have any advice for i know you've talked a lot about trying to make tracks that aren't necessarily frustrating for the actors to be in or annoying for lack of better words what if there's a scene that is meant to feel that way, meant to feel chaotic, meant to feel sort of irritating? Do you have any advice for creating a track that gives that that mood and that feeling without actually driving the actors crazy? It it totally it totally depends on if if they want actual music. You know, I mean, the, the tough thing and, and one thing that I I always kind of struggle with, and I'm not going to say that you know I I don't like doing it because I enjoy doing all kinds of sounds, but it's always it's always a struggle writing clown music and writing that kind of thing, especially if if that's what they want is the actual music. You know, if they want me to paint a scene that's total, you know, background noise and stuff, sure, I could put that together. But if it's like actual clown music, that's kind of a struggle for me because it's, you know, for one, I've never really been a clown at, at any kind of haunted attraction. So to have to put it together, kind of put something together that is going to be consistently on that whole circus and clown theme, but isn't going to drive someone insane. I mean, that's that's a tough thing to do. It's It's... I mean, there's really no right or wrong answer because no matter what, you're going to get to a point where someone's going to be like, wow, this song sucks. It's just, I mean, that's just part of it. I, I know that I've worked in, in Haunted Attraction before to have to hear things and being like, 
you know, I mean, this is, this is just the way it is. And some ways, there's some themes there's some ways that you just can't get around having a track that's just going to make someone's head explode after a while. So kind of, you brought it up with the clowns and that sort of having a different tone. How do you deal with writing something that's for a Halloween event, but is supposed to feel like comedic or is supposed to feel, have a slightly different um, tone in other than just the stereotypical, like, oh, it's scary, it's dark. What do you usually do to go about uh, writing something with a slightly more lighthearted, comedic uh, feeling to it? Things like that are, are, are very, you know, and this, once again, this helps if I'm working with the creative director. Um, a, a while ago, I wrote a, uh, the, the soundtrack for a commercial for the 40th anniversary of uh, the Renaissance Fair. Uh, I didn't actually get aired. I'm sure it's, it's buried on YouTube somewhere. <laughs> I was able to work with the person who was putting that together. And so being able to write something that was, I mean, wasn't, you know, intended to be scary at all. And obviously was, was something that I wasn't necessarily, you know, wasn't really in my wheelhouse, being able to work with the creative director and knowing exactly what they want to hear and being able to put something together. I mean, I was, it was, it was such a nice experience putting that, that soundtrack together because being that it was, I was out of my comfort zone with, with creating something that was, was very light. It was very, you know, fun. Hey, come to the Renaissance Festival. You know, lots of, you know, lots of bells and lots of just happy sounds. It, it totally, you know, that's a lot easier to do when you've got a creative director who knows exactly what they're looking for, who knows what they want to sound like. And that way you can, you can create something and you can play it for them and they can go back and be like, okay, we like this. We don't like this. Let's take this out. Let's try this. I mean, that, that is the best way to make something that's a little bit more lighthearted, especially if, if a creative director for Haunted Attraction says, we want something a little bit different for this room. You know, that is, I mean, it's it's so much easier when you have a, a team that knows what they want to hear, that knows what they're looking for, and is able to say, hey, we want to try something a little bit different with this room. You know, we want to try something that's, a, you know, a little bit more, not as dark and scary, a little bit more up-tempo, a little bit more, hey, you know, it's it, it, it totally helps when you have someone who is very competent and knows exactly what they want and is very passionate about what they're doing. So we have a question here. At the Haunt I work at, some tracks are triggered by the actors. Do you have any tips for splitting up ongoing tracks versus mini tracks? Usually uh, the best way to do that is just having a standalone audio system. I'm not very familiar with actual like sitting up audio systems because I've never actually done that at, at Haunts. But with trigger sounds, um, uh, Blood Bayou at Not Scary Farm, they used to do this where they have a, a pressure point where you'd step on it, it would open the door, some guy with a chainsaw would come through. So you not only would have the doors open, a light would come on, you'd have all kinds of sounds. So it, it's it's kind of having your own dedicated system of sounds for that specific sound and then having your own dedicated system specifically for you know whatever themes, whatever sound you're having as your background noise. You'd, you'd wanna have, I would assume you'd wanna have your own specific sound systems just for the just for the, um, I think they're called uh, source points. You know, you'd want to have, just for those standalone things, their own system. Here's another question. Uh, what are some of your favorite horror movie soundtracks? Kind of a fun one. Oh, John Carpenter. I mean, John Carpenter was a, a big push for me. John Carpenter, They Live, Prince of Darkness. Uh, Prince of Darkness was my favorite horror film. Um, big Trouble in Little China. Uh, the, the Ghost of Mars soundtrack. I mean, I love, you know, John Carpenter's one of my favorite you know, favorite directors and being that he also made his own music you know I mean that was that was huge for me so growing up you know being a fan of John Carpenter and watching Halloween and Prince of Darkness and things like that and, and seeing these things and not only thinking not only did this guy make these movies you know not only did he put all this stuff together he also was writing the soundtrack for them I mean that that's a huge inspiration for me so I mean I think I mean going I mean I also love I mean you got um, Hans Zimmer of course you've got uh, I can't think of his name, but the guy that wrote the soundtrack for Aliens and uh, oh, um, I mean, yeah. things like that. But yeah, John Carpenter, first and foremost, definitely. Uh, and then we have a few more questions here. Let's see. Um, what are some of the common obstacles you run into when creating your sound designs? It's very much trying not to get too muddled into stuff. I mean, there's I mean, I, when I get a, a, a project to start on, it's so many different things are going through my head. It, I want to do, I mean, I want to put so many different things in there. So trying to not get too muddled, trying to put all those different things in there and trying to create something that's going to be coherent, but still tell the same story to every single guest that walks through. And it's kind of tough because 
there's sometimes where I've created things and I've had like, you know, oh, I want to have the sound in the background. So it sounds like this is going on. But then, you know, I listen to the track and I'm like, God, there's just no way for me to fit that without it sounding weird or sounding out of place. And, you know, I've got this awesome idea in my head, like, oh, yeah, this could be going on. This could be going on. And then when you start writing these things out, it's like, okay, yeah, that might be going on in my head. And I might be able to tell what that is. But is 99% of the people that come through a haunted attraction going to be able to hear that and be like, oh, yeah, that's supposed to be this. You know, they might go through and be like, you know, not even recognize it. And that's kind of like a, a tough thing is to not get too deeply involved with trying to put so much in there so that, you know, there's, I mean, I think that I have just as much as many ideas as a creative director does when they come to designing the haunt. When I come to design audio, it's like there's so many things that I want to do. It's trying to to narrow down those things without taking away the product that I want to perform. So, so on that topic, I know you kind of mentioned how we, you mentioned the radio or the the radio in the room and having the audio coming from the radio. In terms of location based speaker placement, and I know you don't you said you don't deal much with the actual installation, mm -hmm. but how does it work with when you're designing? Do you think, oh, I'm going to have um, rain outside and are you able to communicate with the designer like yes there will be speakers outdoors too so that we have that location-based audio or how does that whole process work with communicating with the designers and, and and back and forth usually i i try to go over all the different bases if there's big wide open areas where i know that there's going to be guests especially if it's like say just like a ticketing area or a waiting area or somewhere where they're standing in line you know things like that i I try to make sure that all the points are covered, even if the creative director didn't necessarily bring those up or say, hey, you know, you guys are going to have a lot of con people congregating right here. You're going to have a lot of people, you know, waiting in line for tickets and they're going to be waiting there for a while. You want to have like nothing in playing. You want to have some kind of things like that. It, it totally depends on on where they're going to have people set up and where, you know, obviously where they're going to be able to set their own equipment up. It's being able to know exactly where they're going to have, you know, and asking those questions. Where are you going to have your lines at? Where are you going to have people congregating who might not actually be going into the haunted attraction right off the bat, might be sitting outside, so that it gives them a reason to kind of stick around. It gives them a reason to stay in the area, to stay, you know, or when they're done, instead of just automatically leaving, you know, let's hang out a little bit and, you know, watch what's going on. Or, you know, there's some music playing, let's hang out. And it gives them the opportunity to maybe consider going right back, especially in places like Sinister Point, where you go and you buy a ticket, you go through and you're done, it's like, we could do that again. Yeah. You know, it, it at least keeps people, you know, in the zone, in the area. And as far as, you know, where you put said speakers, I mean, it, it, it's totally, I mean, with Sinister Point, the last big one that I worked with was Scary Place, where it was, you know, it used to be an old Macy's at a mall. It was totally where they had, you know, the ability to put these things without having to stretch, you know, 3,000 feet of cord across, you know, the inside of a department store. Yeah. Well, we're almost out of time here, but I just want to say thank you so much for coming on today. This has been awesome. It's been great. Thanks so much. thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Any last comments? No, it's, I mean, I <laughs> part of this. Hey, thanks. Uh, thank you to uh, you, Dominic. And thanks uh, David Marklin for having me a part of this. Thanks to Midsummer Scream. You guys are awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks, man.